Ah, summer, isn't this the greatest time of the year? There are road trips and swimming pools, long bright evenings in the 4th of July. There are fireflies and gardens and ice cream and mansions. Yes, mansions, you heard me correctly. I just returned from a vacation in very lovely Newport, Rhode Island. And what do you do when you go to Newport? Well, you tour the Gilded Age mansions, of course. Or wait, no, the people who lived there didn't refer to them as mansions. They were cottages. You know, just little summer bungalows by the sea. Uh, no. <laughs> Those Gilded Age homes in Newport are mansions with a capital M. Well, let's talk about Newport tonight. Oh, and there are some other things to visit about as well. Did you see this summer's Downton Abbey movie? I did. I don't know. What do you think? Did I love it or not? Oh, you know I loved it. Okay, well, we'll talk about that later. I've also got a small vintage haul to tell you about. Oh, and I could talk to you a little bit about packing and just a bunch of other stuff, too. It's been a while since I've done an episode of this show, and we have a lot of catching up to do. So what do you say we crank up that theme song? <laughs> Hi there, this is Jennifer Passarello from Circa19XX.com. Welcome to Circa Sunday Night. Why don't you put on your flapper dress and a long strand of pearls and let's Charleston our way to Dreamsville. Hey, this show is the cure for insomnia. This show is Circa Sunday Night. Well, hello there. I'm so glad you're here. You know what? I'm glad I'm here too. I'm back in Circa 19XX land after, oh, how long has it been since I've done this show? A few months, I think. Or, wait, I can tell you right now. I've got my calendar here. April? April. <laughs> Can that be right? Okay, so it's July now, and apparently my last episode was in April. Goodness, Jennifer, what a way to lose an audience. Truly, I am the worst podcaster in the world. You know, when I decided to start this podcast almost three years ago now, I remember reading that in order to attract and maintain an audience, you have to produce shows frequently and regularly. Well, I did get off to a pretty good start this year, but honestly, I just ran out of gas. I've had a lot of things going on at work, and you know, look, here's the problem with work, and I know you know this too. You give your best, most energetic hours of your life to your job. And then there's very little left at the end of the day. Now, when I was younger, I had the stamina to work all day and then pursue other things before and after work and on weekends. But now it's much harder. Anyway, time got away from me and now it's July and I've probably lost two thirds of my audience. You know, that's going to be the, the subject of my next episode. I think I'm going to call it how to lose your podcast audience without even trying. Speaking of listeners, let's head on over to our listener mailbag. Yes, I've got mail. 
Wow, that's such a thrill when a listener reaches out via email. You know, our little relationship here is very one-sided. It's mostly just me doing a lot of talking, right? So after our last episode, I heard from Lynn in Pittsburgh. Hi there, Lynn. I hope you're listening. Lynn wrote me a lovely email that just honestly made my day. Now, how did she find Circa Sunday Night? I'm always interested in that because this is like the most obscure show out on the internet. And so the fact that any of you make it here is quite amazing. (laughs) It's always a mystery to me. Well, here's how she found it. Years ago, I had put a video out on YouTube about Tangy Lipstick. So Tangy Lipstick is a brand that goes all the way back to the 1920s. They're still in business today. And their lipstick is kind of special. I, well, I don't know if it's that special anymore, but certainly was back then because it's an orange color. But when you put it on, it changes colors. So on some people, it might be pink. On other people, it may be a darker type of rosy color. It really depends on who puts the lipstick on. Well, I did a little on video trial of that lipstick. And I had put it out on YouTube. This was, I don't know how long ago. It's not even out there anymore. But Lynn had found that video. And I guess because she had watched it, the algorithm just sort of mysteriously brought up Circa Sunday Night when I started putting my episodes out there on YouTube earlier this year. So, wow. The mysteries of the algorithm brought us together. But anyway, I wanted to share with you a little snippet from her letter. She wrote, I always had an interest in the time frame of your podcast subject matter, so I listened to some episodes. I tend to flip-flop between podcasts, audiobooks, and YouTube, and I found you while I was heavy into YouTube, then moved on to audiobooks. Well, about a month ago, I came back to podcasts, and I've been binge listening to yours. I've listened to, to some of your most recent episodes, but decided to go back and listen from the beginning and am thoroughly enjoying them. I just find it astonishing that anyone would binge listen (laughs) to my broadcast, my, my show. That just astonishes me. So again, it totally made my day. Well, I am so glad, Lynn, that you found your way to Circa 19XX land. And I do know what you mean about flip-flopping between podcasts and audiobooks because I do the same thing. Now, my favorite part of her letter was the postscript. P.S. She writes, I loved your Christmas party episode. She had loved in all caps. You've hit on the perfect party format for us introverts. I think this was the only party I've attended where I wasn't exhausted afterwards and was actually sad when it ended, LOL. Oh gosh, Lynn, that's so true, isn't it? I have hit upon the perfect way to do a Christmas party. (laughs) You know, you don't have to talk to anyone. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't even have to comb your hair. Now, for those of you who haven't heard those episodes, I did two Christmas shows, one in 2020 and one in 2021. Now, those are among the most popular of the uh, Circa Sunday Night episodes. So I've been asked a few times if I'm going to do another one in 2022. I am going to try. That is the plan. I will tell you, those episodes take forever. (laughs) They are a lot of fun, though. I do enjoy working on them. And the fact that people seem to like them, well, that motivates me to keep on doing them. So mark your calendars. The Christmas season is only, I don't know, how how many months is July? Okay, five months. Five months from now. Tick tock. tonight is travel and I want to tell you about all my adventures in Newport we'll do that a bit later but you know hitting the road or in my case hitting the air because of course I flew there is all about trying new things right well I tried out a couple of things before I even left home this time around I bought a new set of luggage 
Yes, my old set was uh, literally falling apart, so I finally invested in a new set of luggage. And uh, so this was the first time I was able to try out my brand new carry-on bag from CalPack. I bought the small and the medium-sized bags in their Hue Pink Sand collection, which is this really beautiful kind of blush color. It's the most beautiful luggage I've ever had. So that was that was pretty exciting. You know, it's it's beautiful. It was easy to roll and to steer. That uh, telescoping uh, trolley handle works really well. That's actually what broke on my, my old suitcase. It can carry a lot of items for its size. It's got a lot of compartments. And most importantly, it coordinates with my other bag that I have. You know, we have to look sharp when we're traveling. Now, um, everything was really great, except the very first time I unzipped one of the inside compartments while I was in my hotel room, it just broke. Yeah, it was really frustrating. Now, um, here's the good news. I think I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I did reach out to CalPAC and they are going to replace the suitcase. The, the bad news is that right now you can't get that color, that pink sand color. They think they're going to have it back later in August, and uh, in which case they will send me a replacement. So I hope that actually happens. Never used CalPAC before, so um, we shall see. It looks pretty. It worked well for the most part. But uh, yeah, we'll have to see about that zipper. Now, the real story, though, behind my matching luggage, my beautiful new luggage set, are packing cubes. Again, by CalPAC. And that's actually how this whole thing started. So even before I bought the suitcases, I had been wanting to try packing cubes because it seems like every travel video that I watch out on YouTube, people are packing up things using these cubes. And I was just really curious. It looked like such an ingenious way to pack. And I'd never used packing cubes before. So I went out, I Googled packing cubes. And of course, I want things that are pretty. And so I found this beautiful set of pink packing cubes. And so I bought those. And then I discovered that there was luggage that you could buy that was the same color as the packing cubes. And so that's kind of how that, that went. I bought the suitcases to match the packing cubes. I'm sure the majority of people would do that the other way around. <laughs> You have the suitcases, and then you look for packing cubes that match. But that's just not the way I did it. So anyway, so now I've got this very coordinated, beautiful sort of arrangement. Now, do you know what I'm talking about when I say packing cubes? They're basically these canvas little mesh zippered pouches, I guess is how you could say it. They're, they're like canvas pouches that you can use to organize your things. So you can have one cube that is dedicated to undergarments, for example, or maybe socks go in another, or your tops go in another, bottoms might go in another cube, maybe you have swimsuits in another cube. So it's just a, a way of organizing your things. So it helps you kind of compress things in your suitcase so you can save some space that way. But also when you're unpacking in the hotel room, you don't have to get everything out. You can just pull your cubes out, arrange them in a drawer or, you know, hang things up, whatever you want to do. But it just makes it really convenient. So I wanted to try these packing cubes and I did. And I am now addicted to packing cubes. In fact, I'm thinking about getting another set. Why do I need another set of packing cubes? I'm not sure, just because you never know. <laughs> but I really do love them. I, I recommend it. You know, even if you've got a suitcase that has a lot of compartments already, and my new luggage does have a lot of compartments, it's still really nice to have these cubes because you can pull them out, you can put them back in. And I found it really helpful when I was repacking, ready to come home. Because, of course, I did some shopping while I was in Newport. So I had far less room in my suitcase coming home than I had when I was going. And using the packing cubes to kind of squish everything down and kind of compress everything, make everything very organized, even when I was packing up to go home, it allowed me to have a little bit more space for my stuff, 
my new stuff that I purchased in those suitcases. So I don't know if you've never used uh, packing cubes before and you think you might want to try them, I will put a link to the CalPak cubes that I have. Again, I got the pink ones. They come in other colors. But, uh, you know, I even made mine a little bit more pretty because each cube has this little card in them so you can write what's packed inside. Well, I didn't do that. I didn't write what was packed inside because you can see, by the way, you, you can see through the mesh to see what is in each cube. So I didn't really feel like I needed to uh, write anything on those little cards. But what I did do is I have these very petite little rose stickers that are just beautiful. They're, they're little rose prints that are taken from old vintage postcards, which, of course, I love. And anyway, I kind of decorated those cards with these little pink roses. So we have the pink packing cubes with these little cards with pink roses on them. So pretty and functional. What could be better? Okay, so we've packed our bags. Now let's head to Newport, Rhode Island. know that I work in the travel industry. That's my day job. And when we're discussing projects or initiatives, we often talk about the romance of travel. What is that? Well, Google has a beautiful definition of romance. Of course, there's romantic love, which is awesome, right? We all like that. But I'm really talking about the notion of romance as adventure. Here's their definition a quality or feeling of mystery, excitement, and remoteness from everyday life. Remoteness from everyday life. I love that. That's travel, isn't it? It's mysterious in that you're stepping into the unknown. Oh, you may have all kinds of plans that you've made. You may even be going someplace that you've been before. But even so, there's discoveries to be made. You no know, corners to peer around, places to explore. On a vacation, you wake up, and you begin your day not really knowing what that day is going to bring. There's excitement in that. Actually, the excitement begins when you book your trip. You know, you make your reservation, you plan your outfits, you pull out your packing cubes and you pack your suitcases up, you hop on the plane or you hit the road in the car, and then at the end of that long day, you turn the key in the lock of your hotel room. Okay, so... I, I do know that hotel doors no longer have key locks, but you know what I mean. Well, and, and you know what? Besides, where I stayed in Newport, my door did have an actual key. Of course, travel offers escape from everyday life. Even if you only travel a very short distance in miles, you can easily find yourself light years from everyday worries or frustrations. So, yeah, I think Google's definition of romance as a quality or feeling of mystery, excitement, and remoteness from everyday life is just right. And it definitely applies to travel. So, as I mentioned, I just returned from Newport, Rhode Island, which is the site of that amazing collection of Gilded Age mansions. Now, this was a colony of super wealthy people. It's where they would spend their summer. So if you look at, at um, the Astors or the Vanderbilts back in the 1900s, or I'm sorry, the 1800s, they would leave their homes in New York. You know, the city is hot, it's busy, it's noisy, it's gritty. In the summer months, they would leave all of that behind and they would come to Newport where they would, you know, have a lot of opportunities to relax and also where there was a very thriving social scene. Now, how those two things fit together, I don't know, because a, you know, a very busy social scene and relaxation, um, I just can't picture those two things in my brain at the same time. But for the people of the Gilded Age, that was a thing. Now, Newport has a, a historical story that 
it goes way beyond the 19th century summer seasons. I mean, when you drive into town, there's this sign welcoming you to Newport. And at the very bottom of that sign, it says established in 1639. Now, I'm a Missouri girl. We don't have buildings older than, I don't know, the late 1800s. So when I travel to New England, it always blows my mind that there are structures there that are far older than the country. I mean, I don't even think Missouri became a state until, what, 1820, 1830, sometime around there. You know, so but if, anyway, Newport has a long history. But then also fast forward to the 20th century. Newport was the site of summer White Houses, and I'm doing air quotes. I know you can't see that, but I'm doing air quotes around summer White Houses for President Kennedy and President Eisenhower. Now, here's a sidebar. While I was exploring Newport, I went to St. Mary Church, which is where John F. Kennedy married Jackie. I found that church completely by accident, but how awesome. Anyway, Newport has that long story to tell, and I'm not going to tell it, but my interest is in the mansions. Let's put ourselves in the mindset of those wealthy New Yorkers who would spend their summers in Newport. There's a nice little description of the summer seasons from Wikipedia, so here it is. Beginning in the mid-19th century, wealthy Southern planters seeking to escape the heat began to build summer cottages on Bellevue Avenue, such as Kingscote, in 1839. Around the middle of the century, wealthy Northerners began construction on larger mansions. By the turn of the 20th century, many of the nation's wealthiest families were summering in Newport, including the Vanderbilts and the Astors, who constructed the largest cottages, such as the Breakers in 1895 and Miramar in 1915. They resided for a brief summer social season in grand mansions with elaborate receiving rooms, dining rooms, music rooms, and ballrooms. Yes, you know how I love a good ballroom. And I was not disappointed with the ballrooms that I found in Newport. But anyway, you know, they had music rooms, ballrooms, all of that. But they did not have very many bedrooms, since the guests were expected to have cottages, in quotation marks, of their own. Many of the homes were designed by New York architect Richard Morris Hunt, who kept a house in Newport himself. The social scene at Newport is described in Edith Wharton's novel, The Age of Innocence. Wharton's own Newport cottage was called Land's End. Okay, so here's a sidebar. Land's End was recently sold for $8.5 million. This is not one of the mansions that you could tour, right? So it was purchased, and I am assuming it's a private residence now. Oh, goodness, must be nice, right? Well, now, Wharton had another estate, this one in Lenox, Massachusetts, which is on my travel list for next year. Now, that house is called The Mount. I've never seen it in person, but I have seen it in pictures, and oh my, it looks beautiful. Now, I'm thinking, as I'm sort of plotting out my trip for next year, that Lenox is a day trip from Newport, so I'm really going to try hard to hit that one when I go back there next summer. Okay, back to Wikipedia. Today, many mansions continue in private use. Hammersmith Farm is the mansion where John F. Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy held their wedding reception. Now, that one was open to tourists at one time as a house museum, but has since been purchased and reconverted into a private residence. What a bummer! How awesome that would have been to tour! But anyway, many of the other mansions are open to tourists, and others were converted into academic buildings for Salve Regina College in the 1930s, when the owners could no longer afford their tax bills. Now, here's just a word about Salve Regina College. How beautiful that campus is! Now, the bed and breakfast that I stayed in was only about a 10-minute walk from Salve Regina, and it was just lovely. Actually, Bellevue Avenue in general has got to be one of the most beautiful residential streets in America, and that was a very short walk from my bed and breakfast as well. So we, we were in a little cluster there of just 
beautiful things, beautiful street, beautiful homes. It's very nice. Okay, so this is a good place to talk about where I stayed. I stayed in a lovely old mansion in the mansion district called The Breakers. <laughs> oh, how I wish. No, no, no. I did not stay in The Breakers. I toured the breakers, more on that later. I did not stay there, but boy, I would if I had the chance. Anyway, uh, I stayed in a beautiful old home, much smaller in scale than the breakers or any of the famous Newport mansions, but certainly much larger than my own home and really lovely. My bed and breakfast was called the Ivy Lodge, and it was this big Victorian home in the late 1800s, complete with this unbelievable, gothic paneled entry hall. It had stained glass windows, the most beautiful rooms, and a spectacular garden. I mean, I have to emphasize this entry hall because it was one of those jaw droppers where you would open the door and it was, what, three, four stories tall with this elaborate staircase, and it was just beautiful. So pretty. Now, I don't know how many total rooms were in this house, but there were many. I believe there were eight guest rooms, and each of the guest rooms, by the way, had its own bathroom. There was a formal dining room. There was the most charming sitting room. There was a big comfy parlor, and then there were some other rooms, too, that were not used by guests. Now, as surprising as this is to people who know me, I have never stayed in a bed and breakfast before. I know this surprises even me, right? Because I love old houses. But here's the thing. <laughs> I also love fancy hotels. <laughs> I can't help myself. So when I'm traveling, that's really where my brain goes is to fancy hotels. But anyway, this was my first bed, uh, bed and breakfast. And I, I really wanted to stay in a big house because I thought that would kind of go with the theme, you know. I love the idea of touring the mansions during the day and then coming home to my own beautiful space at night. It just seemed like the right thing to do. So this was my first bed and breakfast. And I fell in love with the place right off the bat. But... <laughs> Okay, so, uh, you know, I, remember what I was saying about travel being an adventure. You never know what's going to happen. Well, here's the thing that was a little unsettling. I have watched way too many ghost hunter shows. Way too many. <laughs> I don't know why. I just have. So I'll be honest. The thought of staying overnight in a mansion that could possibly be haunted creeped me out a bit. Now, when I say could possibly be haunted, I have never read anything to indicate that the Ivy Lodge is haunted. And believe me, I, I did look because before I even went to Newport, I googled haunted hotels in Newport. And there were several, as you can imagine, given the age of the, of the city and the history of the city, um, that came up. But the Ivy Lodge didn't come up. And I read lots of reviews about it, and, you know, the guests all just loved it. There were no weird experiences that I could find at all. And that, as well as the location, is what made me choose it. I have no desire, no desire whatsoever to seek out weird, scary things. No desire whatsoever. Now, the location was amazing. It was in, within walking distance of just so many cool things, you know, not even just the mansions, but also the cliff walk and the downtown shopping. It was just, it was just a great place and didn't seem to be haunted. And so I thought, okay, this is the place for me. But remember, I had told you that there was that amazing entry hall and it was so beautiful, but 
it was paneled it was dark it was old this mansion dated back to i forget i think it was like 1870 and uh you know that's a lot of history so sure it looked like it could have a ghost in it i could totally see you know some kind of misty thing coming down the stairs or whatever you know in my imagination i could see it anyway well the first night that i stayed there I was completely alone. <laughs> oh my, this is like my worst nightmare, right? So uh, I check in and the owner had told me that there had been a bridal party there that whole weekend and the house was full, but they had all checked out. So I checked in late Sunday and um, I was the only one there. And, you know, <laughs> what made it even more interesting is that the owner and the staff were only there during the hours of eight in the morning and six at night. So after six o'clock, they locked up the house. Now I was free to come and go, of course, but they locked up the house and uh, I would be there all alone in this big house. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie to you, right? We're all friends here. This made me extremely nervous. And, you know, uh, my imagination was going bananas the whole time. And I do not sleep at night all the way through anyway. So even in my own home where I'm very comfortable, I never sleep all the way through. I usually get up around two o'clock. I'll read, I'll do something else, but I just never can sleep all the way through. So I knew this was going to be a, quite an interesting night. So for the most part, I put the TV on. And I was shut up in my little room. My room was so beautiful. It was very cheerful and not scary at all. It was just it was just beautiful and it was decorated in, in all Victorian style and it was just it was so pretty. And then at one point, I, I want to say it was like nine o'clock or maybe nine thirty, I started thinking, I have an opportunity of a lifetime here to go exploring this big house and take pictures. And it was so pretty and everything. I thought, Jennifer, you have got to suck it up, girl, and go out there and just take advantage of this beautiful home. So I did, and I took pictures. I'll tell you, I was even afraid to take pictures, honestly, because I thought, what if I take pictures? <laughs> and then in looking at the pictures on my phone, I see things that were not there. Um, you know, I, see, this is what happens when you are by yourself and your imagination just goes crazy. But anyway, I went around, I took all kinds of pictures and it was lovely. And no, I did not get any weird pictures, no weird experiences whatsoever. Now, in the middle of the night, I did hear some noises because it's an old house and houses make noises. I don't think they were ghostly. I think it was just the house. Um, but that didn't keep me from turning all the lights on and sleeping with all the lights and the television on that first night. <laughs> so, uh, yes, that was quite exciting. Now, the very next day, it was a full house. So they were booked solid. And it, all the spooky scariness just flew right out the door. I mean, you know, I got to know the other guests. They were very, very friendly and nice. And it was extremely quiet, even though there were a lot of other people in the house. I mean, all eight rooms were occupied. And, um, you know, but it was very quiet. So it did kind of feel like I was there by myself. But every now and then I'd hear somebody walking around or something. And I, you know, and I knew that there were other people there. And that made all the difference in the world. So, okay. So the big question, did I see it? He goes, no, thank God. <laughs> Would I go back to the Ivy Lodge in a heartbeat? I loved it. And in fact, when I do go back to Newport next summer, that's where I am going to book my stay and hopefully I can get the same room that I had this time around. shall we talk about the mansions? 
Of course we shall. We must talk about them. Now, I didn't actually see all of the mansions in Newport. I only had actually two touring days, which is not long enough for Newport. I, I really underestimated the time that I needed to see all the cool things and do all the cool things. That's another reason why I'm planning to go back next summer. Um, there's just too much to do in two days. But um, I did try to, to pack in as much as I possibly could in the time that I had. So these are the things that I wanted to make sure that I saw and that I did. And I was able to check all of these things off my list. Okay, so let's just do a rundown here. Item number one, priority number one, and the whole reason why I went to Newport, the Breakers. This is the Gilded Age Mansion. If this was the only mansion in Newport, it would have been enough for me to come and to book my flight there. Next up, second priority, Marble House. This was another jaw-droppingly beautiful mansion. Now, my next must-do made it onto my priority list pretty late in the planning process, and that's thanks to Victoria Magazine. Victoria Magazine did a spread a couple of issues ago about this very pretty country estate. Um, well, and actually, it wasn't just a country estate, but there's an arboretum there, too, and a beautiful garden, and it's right on Narragansett Bay. And when I read the article... I immediately added it to my mansion list, my general mansion list. I didn't realize at first that it was very near the Newport mansions. I didn't even know it was in Newport. Well, it turns out that it was only 30 minutes away. Now, the estate is called Blythewald, and it's different than the other Newport mansions in that it's not as off the charts extravagant. I mean, it was beautiful. Had I not already been to the Breakers and Marble House, um, you know, I would have thought, oh, Blythewald, what a, an unbelievably exquisite place that is. But the Breakers and Marble House have totally ruined all other mansions for me <laughs> because they, and there's no way any other mansions in the country could top those two. But, you know, setting all of that aside, Blythewald was lovely. Now, it's different for another reason, too, though. I don't believe it's owned and maintained by the Preservation Society of Newport County, and therefore it isn't advertised along with those other Preservation Society mansions. So, you know, all of the mansions are managed by that Preservation Society. But I couldn't find any information that uh, Blythewald was part of that collection. Had it not been for Victoria Magazine... I would never have even heard of Blythewald. And when the other guests at Ivy House and I were talking about, you know, we were swapping sightseeing adventures and talking about what we were planning to do each day, when I had mentioned Blythewald, none of them had ever heard of it either. Anyway, it was peaceful and beautiful and just lovely. You know, I think this underscores, by the way, this is kind of a sidebar here, but I think this really underscores the value of Victoria Magazine. I've talked about Victoria Magazine on other episodes of the show. And, uh, you know, we don't, it, Victoria Magazine makes it sound like everything in it is Victorian. And, you know, we're circa 19XX land. We're not circa 19, or we're not circa 18XX although we are in the Gilded Age on this episode, so I guess we are in uh, 18XX land right now. But uh, Victoria Magazine is not all about Victorian things. Um, it is all about things of another era. So, you know, we do dive into the early 1900s in a lot of the pieces that Victoria features. But this is the only magazine that I really think is worth having, honestly. If you're not a subscriber, if you like this show and you like the kinds of things that I like, you will want Victoria Magazine. I guarantee it. I have loved it for years. Okay, well, not far from Blythewald, is another item that was on my priority list and it's this charming topiary garden that is maintained by the preservation society of newport and this garden is called green animals i had to see this i mean first of all botanical gardens strolling gardens arboretums they're just as much a part of my sightseeing adventures as house museums when i'm traveling i love them 
I love gardens and I seek them out when I'm on vacation. Now this was unlike any garden that I've ever been to though because I think there were something like 80 topiaries and they were all in the shape of various animals. I mean, it was just like Edward Scissorhands' garden. <laughs> you know, remember that movie? And Edward Scissorhands would, you know, use his scissor hands to clip these, uh, you know, beautiful topiary uh, shapes and things. And that's exactly what this was like. Now, it was pouring down raining when I was there, but you know what? Have umbrella will travel. I never let rain slow me down when I'm sightseeing. So even though it was raining, it was just lovely. And you know, here's what was also nice about it. I had it all to myself. You know, I had that whole place to myself. So I'm walking around in the rain in this kind of floral fantasy garden. I mean, wow, what a lovely way to spend an afternoon. Okay, so then the next thing that I wanted to have, uh, I wanted to do rather while I was in Newport is do some antiquing. So I, there were a lot of options here for antiquing, but what I chose to do was uh, stop in Bristol. So that wasn't too far from the Topiary Garden or from Blythewald. So I made a stop in Bristol and that is such a pretty little town. It has the oldest 4th of July parade in the country. I was there just days before the 4th of July, and um, oh wow, how patriotic. I mean, it kind of brought a tear to your eye. The whole main street was covered in U.S. flags. You know, there was bunting, there were gigantic flags soaring in the middle of intersections. You know, the uh, lines on the street were painted in red, white, and blue. It was just beautiful. You know, it did my little patriotic heart good to see this. I wish I could have been there for the parade, but alas, I couldn't be there. But uh, anyway, so fun. Maybe next summer. Maybe I'll time it a little differently so I can actually be there on the 4th of July. Okay, so back in Newport, there were other mansions. So I wanted to see the Elms, which incidentally was a block away from Ivy Lodge where I was staying. So that was pretty easy to get to. And then there was Rosecliff. Now, Rosecliff appealed to me because, I mean, just like the, the same that the name implies, there were rose motifs that were carried throughout the house, and it had this beautiful rose garden at the side of the house, and then beyond the rose garden, you could see the ocean in the background. It was so pretty. Now, as soon as you walked in Rosecliff, you saw the ballroom. <sighs> oh my, it was beautiful. You know how I love a good ballroom. <laughs> and uh, it was so beautiful. There's just no words to describe it. Okay, so that was Rosecliff and the Elms. And that really did it for all my mansions that I, were able to, uh, that I was able to see. So there's still about four or five of them that are on the list. Those are things that I'm going to have to check out next year. Now, the last must-do for me was the famous Cliff Walk. The Cliff Walk is a scenic three-and-a-half-mile walkway, basically, that overlooks the Rhode Island Sound and the Atlantic Ocean. Many of the Gilded Age vacation homes um, of those New York millionaires were built along that walkway, and it dates back a very long time. So they started kind of building that walkway. The millionaires started improving that walkway around 1880, and at first it was just a, a rough footpath. But then, you know, the estate owners, they improved the walk over several decades. And so now we have this, this walk that's the three and a half miles. I did the whole walk. And really, it's just a thing you do when you go to Newport. I highly recommend it. And then, of course, there was some seriously fun shopping in the downtown wharf area of Newport. Yeah, as I mentioned, my suitcase was heavier when I left than when I arrived. It is funny how that happens. Okay, so that's what I packed into my little four-day trip. There are several other mansions I mentioned, as I, as I uh, told you, but the ones that I did tour, the Breakers, Marble House, the Elms, and Rosecliff are all the headliners. Those are the must-see, especially the Breakers. I mean, you just cannot go to Newport 
and not see the breakers. But those other houses are kind of the headliners as well. And then Blythewald was sort of that nice little addition. Now, I'm not going to try to talk about all of these mansions because how do you do that in a podcast without boring everyone to death? Um, <laughs> I don't know. You really have to see them. But I do want to talk about the breakers because, you know, like the Biltmore in North Carolina or Hearst Castle in California, it's just one of those houses that you really should know if you're going to hang around circa 19xx land. Yes, I know the breakers was built in 1880. But uh, it was still an active location um, into the 1900s. So I feel like we really need to talk about that one. I bought a book about the mansions, of course, at the gift shop at the Breakers. And my book was published by that Preservation Society of Newport. It was written by Thomas Gannon and Paul Miller. And I thought I would, I would read a little bit of their opening description of the breakers, just to kind of give you a sense of what it's like. So here are a few passages from their book. If the Gilded Age were to be summed up by a single house, that house would have to be the breakers. Measuring 250 feet by 150 feet and containing 70 rooms, the four-story limestone palace is as much a monument to its time as it was a summer home for Cornelius Vanderbilt II and his family. Work on the home began in 1893 and was completed in less than two years. Okay, sidebar, this is extremely hard for me to believe. <laughs> because when you go into the breakers, there is so much detail I mean, it, there's just so much going on. I mean, there were whole rooms that were designed in Europe and then shipped to Newport for reassembly. There were exotic materials used. There was unmatched craftsmanship, um, all done in two years. I mean, that's just wild. It took me a full year to get four new windows installed in my house this last year. <laughs> but then, of course, I'm not a Vanderbilt, am I? So anyway, before I get back to the book, I want you to picture these rooms. And actually, you can even do better than that. I'm going to provide a link to the Newport Mansions website, and you can view a gallery there that will just blow your mind. You step into these rooms, and it's just like stepping into a fairy tale. It's all crystal and shimmer and just the most beautiful imagery in the world. Okay, back to the book. For months, as the house went up, Newport Society eagerly anticipated the opening of the breakers. The interiors were finely crafted in gilded wood, marble, and bronze. When the housewarming, combined with a coming-out party for 20-year-old Gertrude Vanderbilt, was held on August 14, 1895, the breakers made a spectacular backdrop. More than 300 guests were escorted into the Great Hall by footmen wearing the distinctive maroon livery of the v Vanderbilts. The hall, rising nearly 50 feet and lined with cane stone, provided, as it still does, a fitting introduction to the sense of space and vista that exists in all the public rooms downstairs. The east wall is almost entirely glass, affording an unbroken view across the terraces and the lawn to the ocean and the distant reef that gave the breakers its name. Eight matching sets of doors lead from the great hall to opulent reception rooms. The two-story dining room is lined with twelve massive shafts of rose alabaster, topped with gilded bronze capitals. The gray and gold panel music room has gray ionic pilasters and furnishings and draperies of red Italian-cut velvet. The cool, grotto-like billiard room is faced from floor to ceiling with matched slabs of gray-green marble. The grand scale continued behind the scenes in the service areas. Of the 70 rooms in the house, 33 were for the staff. Whether in Newport or New York, Mrs. Vanderbilt reportedly could give a dinner party for 200 without calling in extra help. The kitchen, where family meals were prepared behind sealed doors so that no odors escaped into the living quarters, was a, a grand and efficient two-story structure. The two-level butler's pantry, 
where the family silverware was kept in a vault 10 feet deep, held fine porcelain, china, and glassware. Now, next to the ballrooms, I'd have to say my favorite feature of these old mansions would have to be the butler's pantries. That's where all that beautiful crystal and silver and china and oh, just beautiful things for the table were stored. Now, there were several china patterns on display in the various mansions, not just the breakers, but I mean, really in all the mansions. And honestly, I probably took more pictures of those china displays than anything else. What is it about china and crystal that is just so dreamy? I've heard place settings described as jewelry for the table, and I think that's really true, isn't it? I mean, I think dishes are also like little masterpieces. They tell a visual story on a very limited surface and, you know, kind of a diminutive scale. Anyway, one of the souvenirs that I brought home was a small platter with some matching cups and the pattern on the platter and the cups was based on the china sets at the Kingscote Mansion. Now this, I have to say, is one of the mansions that I didn't visit, <laughs> but their dishes were sold at the Breakers gift shop, so, you know, what could I do? I snapped them up. So not sure how, but all the pieces made it home without breaking. I was pretty concerned about that. Okay, so that's our little introduction to the Breakers. Now, that was the summer home of Cornelius Vanderbilt II and his wife, Alice Claypool Vanderbilt, and their children. The Biltmore, now that's that other famous Vanderbilt mansion. That's the one that's in Asheville, North Carolina. Well, that was the home of George Washington Vanderbilt and his, wa his wife, Edith Stuyvesant Vanderbilt. Marble House was the home of yet another branch of the Vanderbilt family. That was William Kissam and Alva Vanderbilt. Now, for those of you who've watched HBO's The Gilded Age, the main characters, the Russells, they're the ones that are based on William and Alva Vanderbilt. So on that show, when they begin eyeing Newport as the site of their summer cottage, which actually happened in the last season, you know, on the show, Marble House is the real life inspiration for, you know, what will, I'm assuming, ultimately become the Russell's home in Newport. Okay, now, since I've been back, I've been asked a few times now, okay, well, of all the mansions, you know, the Breakers, Marble House, the Elms, Rosecliff, Blythewald, what is my favorite house? Which is the one that I like the best. Well, I mean, the Breakers. That's my favorite house, you know, due in large part, honestly, to the color scheme of the house. I love the creams and the light blues and the gray and the gold. I just think it is stunning. There are times when you walk into rooms at the Breakers and you honestly don't know where to look. It's just overwhelming and it is so beautiful. Oh my gosh, I can't even describe for you. Um, just glittery and beautiful and just soothing colors and just, uh, just the best. What can I say? The best. Okay, so the Breakers is my favorite house. But if I think about all the mansions that I've been to over the years, and there have been many, if I'm looking at the grounds, like the gardens, the grounds on which the homes sit, I have to go with the Biltmore in Asheville. That setting in the Blue Ridge Mountains is one of the most beautiful that I have ever seen. So stunning. You know, when I went there, I stayed on the property. So, you know, again, I couldn't stay in the Biltmore, but they have a couple of hotels there on the property, not within, you know, sight of the mansion. It's a little bit farther away. You have to drive there. Well, or you can walk there. I actually walked from my hotel to the Biltmore, but that took over an hour. So there's there's a little bit of a distance there, but I was still on the property. And I went for very long walks on that property. And honestly, I will never forget it. That was one of those experiences that I will carry with me forever. It was like walking through a dream. 
it really did leave a lasting impression on me. So hands down, the most beautiful setting of any mansion that I visited has been the Biltmore in Asheville. Okay, well, we're going to take a little break. And then when we come back, I want to share with you a list that I made while reflecting on my visit to these mansions. And in my notes, I wrote down 10 features that I believe make a room stunning. All right, I'll see you on the other side. back. Okay, so you walk into a Gilded Age mansion and your eyeballs are popping out of your head because everything is just too beautiful. Let's unpack that sensation. What specifically makes a room in a Gilded Age mansion beautiful? And, big question here, can we do something similar in our own humble homes? <laughs> mm, I don't know. I made a list while I was actually in one of the mansions, I was in the Rosecliff Ballroom, and I was making note of the features in that mansion and in that ballroom, as well as the other mansions that I had visited, that really stood out to me. Okay, so here they are, the 10 things that I think makes a Gilded Age Mansion room beautiful. Number one, glass. Glass doors, glass cabinetry. Crystal light fixtures, crystal dinnerware, crystal and glass everywhere you look. At Marble House, there were just these amazing bevel glass doors between rooms that reflected the light. I, I, they were stunning. I just found myself staring at these doors. There were also chandeliers that were in there, and, and that was a factor too. But I don't want to de-emphasize the importance of those glass doors. Not only the glass doors between rooms, but also glass doors on bookcases and on cabinetry. I love that. You can see what's behind the glass, but you can't get at it. When things are behind glass, they seem more precious somehow, more mysterious. So glass, and a lot of it, is essential in a Gilded Age room. Number two, mirrors. 
Okay, yes, I do know that mirrors are glass. I could have put those in the same category as number one, but I actually put them in their own category because they are just that important. The most striking rooms were those with mirrors that were actually embedded into the walls. They were across from windows, above fireplaces, near doors. So when I say embedded into the walls, they were built into the walls. They weren't just like hanging on the walls. And they, oh my goodness, they were so beautiful. I mean, mirrors create depth, right? I mean, we do that in our own homes. And there's just something magic about them. You know, now one mirror won't do. No, we're talking about multiple mirrors and not little mirrors, not like little scatter mirrors. No, we're talking about oversized mirrors and at interesting angles. Oh yes, mirrors, mirrors, mirrors. They are a must have. Number three, gold. Ormolu, gold leaf, just gold, gold, gold. Gold accents on the walls, on the ceilings, on the furniture, everywhere. Number four, the color cream. Yes, cream trim, cream as a base color that ties all the other things together. That is the recurring neutral. You know, it didn't seem to matter what mansion that I was looking at, what room I was in, cream was that consistent component of the color scheme, the, the foundation of the color scheme. So number four, the color cream. Number five, now, I do want to go through the other essential colors. So number five is kind of the palette. Sky blue, deep red, black. Now, there were other colors too, but those are the ones that seem to show up most frequently. In the private rooms, the colors were a little bit more subdued. I mean, again, there was cream. There was kind of a rosy color, again, with the sky blue. So beautiful. I mean, you wouldn't see a lot of oranges or purples. I mean, I can think of some lavender, but you know, there were a lot of colors that you didn't see, but there were certainly these deep, rich colors that were so beautiful. Sky blue, deep red, black. Number six, chinoiserie. Asian motifs in china patterns, fabrics, koi bowls used for plants, you know, just a, a lot of those kind of patterns that are so pretty. Also, Asian influence in lacquered furniture. So there were some cabinets and that kind of thing that had sort of that Asian influence. Number seven, ferns and indoor greenery. The more, the better. Number eight, dressing screens. I frequently see dressing screens with elaborate floral scenes painted on them, you know, when I'm touring mansions. And, and honestly, in most of the private rooms, you would see these dressing screens and not just in the women's rooms either i mean they do tend to be very girly and feminine which i love um but uh, for sure they were really common in bedrooms and and so on i would love to own a dressing screen and i've wanted one for many many years i see them very rarely when i'm out and about but when i do see them they are expensive so, um, yeah, no dressing screen for Jennifer, at least um, not today, <laughs> not at this point. All right, number nine, decoration from ceiling to floor, from colorful rugs on the floor to elaborate murals on the ceiling. Gilded Age mansions followed the more is more philosophy. Think about the ceilings in our own homes. I mean, you know, there's not much going on up there. But one of the recurring motifs that I saw in the mansions would be sky mural, murals. So you'd look up to the ceilings and they would have a faux sky, you know, with the, the blue background and the fluffy clouds. That was very common. And so it was almost like you were looking up through a, a gigantic window in the ceiling. And that leads us to number 10, fountains. You know, I should have probably added to this um, statuary. I kind of see those two things as going together. But anyway, fountains uh, both inside and out. So at the breakers, there was an indoor fountain that was under the stairs. It's pretty impressive looking, actually. And then at the elms, there was an indoor fountain within its conservatory. Now, of course, outdoor fountains were extremely common. I think 
maybe all of the mansions had an outdoor fountain somewhere. So that's, you know, pretty uh, iconic as well. Okay, so there are my 10 features that make Gilded Age mansions so beautiful. You know what? I'm going to throw in one more, actually. I'm going to throw in a number 11, and that would be black iron. I love iron gates, you know, like black wrought iron gates, outdoor furniture. Um, there were staircases that ha had iron work along those elaborate, you know, elaborate grand stair uh, staircases. So beautiful. And then, of course, the gates outdoors and, and all of that. I love black iron. I, I do have a lot of black iron in my own home and also outside. So let's, let's throw that in as number 11. That's our honorable mention. Okay, so for a quick review, what do we need to achieve that look of a Gilded Age room? We need glass. We need mirrors and lots of them. Gold, gold, gold. We need a lot of shimmery gold. The color cream as a base color. Then an extended palette of sky blue, deep red, and black, especially in public rooms. And then kind of that sky blue, a rosy color, maybe peach tones in the private spaces. Shinwasserie, ferns and indoor greenery, dressing screens placed in corners, or really <laughs> anywhere, anywhere around a room, they look great. Decoration of floors and ceilings, fountains indoors and out, and that honorable mention, black iron. So which of these will you incorporate into your decorating scheme? Okay, well, it's very fun to dream about the Newport Mansions, but now we're going to move forward in time to the 1920s, actually the late 1920s. We're almost in the 1930s, and we're going to visit with our old friends over at Downton Abbey. Now, we're back in circa 19xx land now. You know, we're out of the 1800s, back in the 1900s. Did you see the film? I saw it. Yes, I actually took myself to see that movie, and I loved it. <laughs> Have you told them, Lady Grantham? She's told us nothing. Do sit down. I've come into possession of a villa in the south of France. What villa? <laughs> Start at the beginning. Years ago, before you were born, I met a man. They spend a few days together, and he gives her a house. You never thought to turn it down? Do I look as if I'd turned down a villa in the south of France? A telephone call for you, my lord. Mr. Barber is a producer and director. He wants to make a film at Downton. A moving picture at Downton. But the big film stars, famous ones. I think it's a horrible idea. Actresses plastered in makeup and actors just... Plastic. There is something about it, like a wild animal ready to spring. Ready to spring on you, you mean? Action! Cut! Cut! Sorry. The modern world comes to Downton. Why do you think he gave you the villa? That is where the mystery resides. Then we're off to the Riviera. And with any luck, we'd miss the whole of Mary's frightful film. I do hope that was a prop. You steer ahead. You're the captain now. They better be warned. The British are coming. Welcome to the Villa of the Doves. It's a beautiful place. How happy you must be. Oh, my goodness. Who is she? The Lady Grantham I first went to work for. Granny! Why did you invite us here? It doesn't look good for the pyre if she felt the need to keep it a secret. There's trouble in paradise. You don't need me to tell you that marriage is a novel full of plot twists along the way. 
Women like us fall into two categories, dragons and fools. You must make sure they think of you as a dragon. But with that, I will say goodnight and leave you to discuss my mysterious past. It seems the public only want films that talk. I should have thought the best thing about films is that you can't hear them. It'd be even better if you couldn't see them either. <laughs> you know what's great about that film? I, yeah, I was thinking about this on my way home from the theater. It's just quiet. There's no murder. There's really no intrigue. I mean, we have a bit of mystery behind why the Dowager has acquired this amazing Mediterranean villa, but even that's just kind of an everyday question that, I don't know, we might have about the happenings in our own lives. You know, unexpected little surprises that make us wonder, hmm, how did this happen? Or what's the story here? That's the kind of thing that happened in Downton Abbey. Nothing noisy, nothing overly dramatic. It, it was a quiet little story. And, um, you know, I don't know, when I, when I watched this latest film, which, by the way, I enjoyed it more than the first film, it was almost like slipping into an alternative life for a couple of hours with people I know, <laughs> you know, people who are familiar, Lady Mary and Lady Edith and, you know, Lady Grantham and, and all of the folks, Brandon, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Branson, <laughs> you know, all of those folks. They feel like people that we know. It's kind of like a little catch-up. Hey, what's going on since we saw each other last? Now, people who aren't fans of the show probably just cannot understand that at all. But we do, don't we? I'll tell you, you know, when I when the movie ended, I, I almost cried. <laughs> There's kind of this melancholy ending that we all saw coming. And don't worry, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to tell you what happens at the ending, although I'm dying to. But, um, you know, there, there was some sadness there. But really, I think what made me the most sad is just kind of saying goodbye to all of the characters because I'm afraid I'm not going to see them again. There's always that question, is this the last Downton film? Now, in an interview with IndieWire, Julian Fellows said he certainly wouldn't discount another movie, but much of his decision will depend on timing. So he said this, these things become clearer over time. If there's still a demand for more Downton and the actors, if enough of them want to do it, well, then I certainly wouldn't block it, he said. Then he said that he's learned to never say never. I've had five times now of thinking that I've said goodbye to these characters, and then here they are again. Okay, well, I don't know how reassuring that is. <laughs> But I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I don't want that to be the end. So, again, you know I'm dying to talk about this movie in detail. But I'm going to leave you to discover it for yourself. I will say that there are essentially two primary storylines with a few sidelines as well. So, um, in the first storyline, there's a film crew that comes to Downton. They're wanting to use it as a backdrop for a movie. And this generates a very welcomed income for the estate. Now, in this storyline, Lady Mary presides over Downton, and she takes on kind of an unexpected role in assisting the director of the film in transitioning that project from a silent film to a talkie. So that was kind of a fun storyline. Now, meanwhile, the rest of the family is engaged with the second storyline. So there's this inheritance of a beautiful villa on the French Riviera. Okay, so I said I wasn't going to include any spoilers here, um, but you know me, I just can't contain myself. I do want to mention one thing in this film that I thought was particularly striking, and this is a spoiler. This is a spoiler. So if you want to fast forward past this section, you know, now is the time to do it. But here's what, here was a segment that I particularly loved. Lady Mary's husband, Henry Talbot, is not in this movie. Honestly, in the last movie, I, I don't know that he made much of an appearance there either. But he's not in this movie at all. Where is he? Well, he's in Istanbul. I can't remember why. I don't know if he's in a race. You know, he races cars. Is that what's going on? I don't know. Anyway, he's in Istanbul. Um, we get the idea 
that Mary is not quite happy in her marriage. Maybe she's feeling a little lonely. Things are not quite how they should be. She, she's not necessarily 100% happy about the situation. Okay, well, that sets the stage for an affair with the director of the movie that they're making at Downton because, you know, he, he discloses the fact that he has fallen in love with her. I mean, who doesn't, right? Lady Mary has these men falling all over her all the time. But here's what's cool about this. It does set the stage for this affair to happen. But unlike what would almost certainly happen in other films of our day, the affair doesn't happen. She remains true to her vows to Henry, and she says that. She doesn't even give the director, I can't remember the director's name, she, can't, she doesn't even give, even give the director really much of a chance. She, she very politely turns him down and says, you know, I'm married it's just one of these things that, you know, I, I'm committed to. You know, you don't marry people just for the happy times. You marry them for always. And so that was kind of her stance. And I thought that was so beautiful. You know, and at the same time, we have this lovely model of marriage in Lord Grantham and Cora. I want to see more of this in films. I, I think it's so fantastic. You know, this holding up of marriage as this beautiful ideal. And listen, I'm saying this as someone who isn't married. And even I see the value in that. It's just beautiful. Well, this is a feel-good film, you know, for sure. It made me feel good. And Julian Fellows has acknowledged that. He said this about the latest film. He said, if we're useful for cheering people up and giving them an easy time of it, well, that doesn't bother me. And I agree. What more should a film do? I think that's exactly what a film should do. Well, anyway, I could go on and on about this movie. You have to be a longtime fan to love this film. If you have no history with the story, this film is going to be a terrific bore. But for me, I just loved it. Loved it. Yes, capital letters, loved it. Oh, please, Julian Fellows and cast, keep these movies coming. I know he listens to this show. No, he doesn't listen to this show. But anyway, if he did listen to this show, <laughs> I would beg him to uh, keep this show going. All right, before we leave Downton, I made an interesting discovery that I thought I would share with you. Now, we all know the familiar Downton Abbey theme song, right? Well, I wanted to find out a little bit more about that song. It turns out that Town & Country Magazine did an interview with the composer, John Lunn. Now, this is a gentleman I've never heard of, so it's John Lunn, L-U-N-N. -N. Um, and here's what, what it said in the article. That was not supposed to be the theme song. Lunn wrote that melody as the background for the opening scenes of Season 1, Episode 1. So he, he wrote it for the op opening scenes, but not as the overall theme song. So here's what he said about the theme in that Town & Country interview. It was the first piece of music I ever wrote for the series, and the very first episode in season one didn't have a title sequence. It just kind of started straight into the drama. There was the telegram. Remember the telegram about the Titanic? Yeah, so, okay, so there was a telegram, and there was a train, and then there was Bates sitting, looking out of the train window. He was looking rather forlorn. Oh, gosh, this takes me back, right? I haven't thought about this opening scene for so long. We don't know Bates' backstory. We don't know that the telegram is carrying news that the heir to Downton Abbey has drowned on the Titanic. Um, but, you know, we eventually arrive at this amazing shot of the house. Okay, so here's the article again. The theme song was the music that I wrote for that sequence. The energy of it and the emotion of it just seemed to suit the whole season. I think we found three or four places in the very first episode to use it. The very next scene was the servant getting the house ready in the morning. And there's a similarity with the train because the house is a well-oiled machine in a way. And, um, you know, and so is the train. So we used it again. And then, by the time I finished the first episode, it became obvious that this was going to be the main theme of the whole show. So then we did a 30-second version of it, 
they put the pictures to it and the music, which is quite an unusual way of doing things. They're quite vague, the titles. I mean, you see candelabras, you see a dog's bottom. That's true, isn't it? I forgot about that. Um, there's pictures of the house, but it's the music that's really kind of giving an idea of the thing that you're about to see. Really more than the pictures, I would say. Okay, apparently when the first post-series movie was in production, there was some question as to whether or not they were going to use that theme. They used it during a test screening, and when the people heard that theme, I guess everybody cheered. So they knew that that was, you know, that was going to be the theme. There was no changing that theme. So for this latest fil film, he said, it wasn't even a question. I mean, honestly, <laughs> can you imagine any other song playing in showing that High Clear Castle or, or Downton Abbey? N no, no other theme would do. So did you happen to know about this theme song that it has lyrics? Oh, yes, it does. The song is called, Did I Make the Most of Loving You? I'm not going to sing it because I'm actually saving that for my episode on how to lose a podcast audience without even trying, but I will share the lyrics with you. So again, the melody is by John Lunn. The lyrics are by Don Black. And here they are. Did I make the most of loving you? So many things we didn't do. Did I give you all my heart could give? Two unlived lives with lives to live. When these endless lonely days are through, I'll make the most of loving you. Did we make the most of all we had? Not seeing you makes my heart sad. Did we make the most of summer days? We still have time to change our ways. When these endless lonely days are through, I'll make the most of loving you. Did those tender words stay in my head? So many things were left unsaid. Did I give you all my heart could give? Two unlived lives with lives to live. When these endless lonely days are through, I'll make the most of loving you. Ah, I love it. Okay, so if you missed out, Nabby, a new era in theaters, you can purchase it on Amazon Prime. Now, as of this recording, it's still pricey at $19.99, but, you know, of course, that price will come down. So, enjoy. <laughs> our little show tonight I wanted to share with you two awesome vintage treasures that came into my possession just before I left for Newport yeah two awesome things came my way in one week I guess you could call this a vintage haul I don't know what, what constitutes a haul if I'm only going to tell you about two things does that count as a haul well we're, we're gonna call it a haul okay awesome thing number one a pair of mid-century lucite candles in mint condition. I've been searching high and low for several years now for lucite candles. Now these are plastic decorative candles that can't be lit by the way, that would be a disaster. They're just for decoration. <laughs> um, they were popular in the 1960s and I think maybe even in the early 1970s and they're extremely hard to find at least in my part of the country. Now you can get them on eBay, but they're expensive and they're usually in not so great condition. Most commonly you see them in this clear acrylic and in the acrylic you can see gold, silver, or copper colored flakes, you know, that are kind of mixed into the plastic. And you know, a lot of times the little wicks are missing or they might be frayed or the acrylic is cloudy or scratched. So, you know, first of all, it's hard enough to find them, but when you do find them, they're just not, they don't necessarily look all that great. Well, my mom surprised me with a beautiful 
kind of subtle green pair. I didn't even know they came in this color. It's it's a very light green. It's almost barely green, but just at this most beautiful shade of green in absolutely perfect condition. I mean, I've never seen such beautiful Lucite candles. And she found them at a thrift store for, hold on to your seat, $2. What? <laughs> yes, I almost died. So I was over at my mom's house and, and she said, I have something for you. And she handed me this little bag. And at first, I, I didn't know what I was looking at because they were kind of wrapped up funny. And as I'm unwrapping them, I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, this can't be what I'm thinking of. And my mom just thought that was hilarious. But anyway, yes, I almost died. I told her that if I had spotted these at the thrift store, I would likely have taken a heart attack. I am not exaggerating. <laughs> Because I nearly did uh, right there in her living room. Um, now, now I have them prominently displayed on my kitchen table. And I've informed my family that when I die, I want to be buried with these uh, candles. But uh, anyway, yes, I was quite pleased with that. Okay, awesome thing number two. In 1962, World's Fair Souvenir Jim Beam Whiskey Decanter. And this decanter is in the shape of the Seattle Space Needle. I got this for free. How cool. So I donated a bunch of stuff to our local uh, Disabled American Vets uh, thrift store. This is a place that I like to shop. So I uh, made a donation. This is after me cle cleaning out all my closets and things. So the idea was to get rid of things and not bring home things. And yet I did bring home this Space Needle uh, decanter. But anyway. It, it, it just couldn't be helped. Okay, so anyway, when I donated all this stuff, they gave me a voucher and, uh, you know, for, I, I forget what it was for, $5 or $10 or something in the store. And that voucher just burned a hole in my pocket. So I walked right in, <laughs> I dumped my stuff and then I walked in and this decanter was the first thing that I saw and I had to have it. Um, what struck me first were the colors. I thought the colors were neat. But then I saw along the side in gold, it said Century of Progress. And I knew instantly what that was. Century of Progress is kind of the, the slogan or the tagline for the 1962 World's Fair. Hang on. Pardon the interruption. This is editor Jennifer here, and I just have to jump in here. It was not Century of Progress. That's not what it says on my decanter. It's Century 21. Century of Progress, I do believe, was a different World's Fair. I want to say it was the Chicago World's Fair, not the Seattle World's Fair. So just had made that clear. I'm, I'm going through doing the editing, and I'm like, no, that's not right. What What is this gal talking about? <laughs> All right, now back to the show. Now, something I've mentioned on this show in the past is I've got kind of this bizarre fascination with the 1962 World's Fair. That's the one in Seattle, but especially the 1964 World's Fair in New York. So, of course, I knew what this was, and it's in the shape of the Space Needle. It's in excellent condition, just excellent, and it was so beautiful. Now, it was dirty. I had to clean it but it was absolutely beautiful. So what an exciting day that was uh, to bring that home. I checked it on eBay and they sell between $50 and $80 and I got mine for free. So yeah, I was pretty happy. Okay, well, that just about does it for tonight's show. Hey, do me a big favor and uh, subscribe out on the YouTube channel or, you know, do the other things that I mentioned before. Um, I would really appreciate your support. But, you know, what the biggest thing that you can do is just listen and come back and see me every now and then. Thanks again so much for tuning in. And, uh, you know, Friday, it's not so far away. Friday will be here before for we know it. Bye for now.